Hello everybody and welcome to the Better Sleeping Habits webinar for children over 10 years. So welcome to the webinar. Um, facilitating the webinar today is myself, Rebecca Penny. So I am one of the parent support workers for the Starting Well Partnership, Wire Forest. So I'm based at the Brookside Family Hub in Kidderminster and also the Half Crown Wood Family Hub in Stourport on Severn. So we provide um, parenting support um, to all our families in the local areas um, within our family hubs and virtually as well. So we're just going to take you through the agenda and what today's um, webinar is going to look like. Um, so we're going to be having a look at why sleep is important and thinking about our own natural body clocks and natural rhythms, otherwise known as circadian rhythms. We're just going to have a bit of a think about things that might get in the way of sleep, why we sometimes have trouble sleeping. We're also going to have a look at the teenage brain. So looking at those changes that take place with the onset of puberty and then when the brain grows through that extra developmental phase of growth as well. We're going to have a look um, at the impact that puberty has um, on our teenagers and on their sleep patterns as well. And then we're going to have a look in general at um, sort of different ages and the general recommended average sleep needs for different people as well. We're also going to have a look at those possible signs of sleep deprivation. So how do we might how might we recognize that we're sleep deprived? How might we recognize this in our children as well? And thinking about the benefits of what's known as sleep diaries. So introducing this to families if this is something new for you. Uh, we're going to have a look at some sleepy foods, so thinking about those foods that might be beneficial to aid sleep, what are those things that you might be able to have um, early evening before you go to bed. We're going to also have a look at the benefits of having a good bedtime routine and thinking about, you know, the benefits to this when it's established early, um, or if this is something that's new to you, how you might go about establishing a new bedtime routine. We're also going to give you some top tips for aid in sleep and look at some sources of support for you as well. And then we'll give you our contact details at the end if you do feel that you require any further support or if you might have any questions that you'd like for us to answer. Okay. So I'm just going to go on to slideshow and uh, have a look at why sleep is important. So we're just going to have a think now about why sleep is so important. Why is it that we really do all need, um, you know, a good, good sleep um, and a good amount of time sleeping? So sleep is really, really important, um, you know, for the whole body to repair itself. So not just thinking physically, but mentally as well. You know, we really need the body to heal. Um, you know, we also need that time for our mind to be able to process everything that we have done each day as well. So it's really important that we have sleep in order to repair we need it to be able to focus. So thinking about, you know, it might be just general everyday things that we do every day. It might be that we need a certain amount of focus if we're gonna be learning a new skill. If we're in a new scenario, just being able to process that new experience. So we really need it to help us to keep our attention and to keep us focused as well. So it's really important as well to self-regulate our own emotions and our feelings. It's very natural for us all with whatever we have going on in our lives to have, you know, that roller coaster of emotions. Um, so to be able to self-regulate and be able to help ourselves to recognise, you know, when we need to just take some time for ourselves, it might be that we need to go to a quiet place to calm down might be that we need to go to somebody to talk about how we're feeling, but just being able to recognise, you know, that we need to process our emotions and how we're feeling is otherwise known as self-regulation. 
So we also need sleep to help us relax. So to be able to wind down um, and be able to stay calm. So we're really helping ourselves to relax and alleviate those stress levels of cortisol um, and, you know, try and keep any adrenaline and things like that to a low. Um, so being able to relax and have that balance of relaxation so that the body isn't in, you know, high levels of stress all the time, um, which then can be detrimental, you know, for your physical health and your mental health as well. So we also need it to keep our strength, you know, so just, you know, doing our everyday activities, we need a lot of strength for that as well. Um, so as much as what we're eating gives us strength, it's really important that we help our bodies to rest so that we've got that energy and we've got that strength to be doing those things that we need to do. So we really need to be able to process things as well. So to be able to take on board, you know, what's going on, be able to understand, you know, why certain things are happening. Um, so sleep is really, really important for the brain to be able to process all of those experiences, all of that extra information that maybe we've taken on for that day. And then just growth in general. So we, we notice in children, especially, you know, younger children, we tend to notice when they've had a growth spurt. Um, this also happens as your children get older and into the teenage years as well. Um, but a lot of growth happens when children are asleep. Um, so this is when the, the brain might grow the most and also physically. So looking at their bones as well. Um, so this is when growth happens most is when we're asleep. So we're now going to watch a video um, all around our own natural body clocks um, and why it's important to kind of recognise our own body clocks and what that actually looks like. So I'm just going to stop sharing the PowerPoint just for a second. I'm just going to share our other screen, which hopefully we should be able to view the video. OK, so I'll just make sure that I've shared the computer sound so that we can all hear it as well. How do you know when it's time to sleep or time to wake up in the morning? More powerful than any alarm clock are your own circadian rhythms. 24 hour cycles of biological processes that exist in every living thing. They keep your body functioning on schedule, day and night, wherever you are. And the key to it all is a bunch of cells in the retina of the eye called photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Whilst the eye's rod and cone cells are responsible for vision, these retinal ganglion cells detect the brightness of our surroundings and send that information through the optic nerve to the suprachiasmatic nuclei, the brain's master clock. The master clock coordinates all the tiny clocks that govern the behaviour of the cells throughout the body. Taking light as its cue, the master clock determines a continuous cycle of physiological changes within our cells, including the production of hormones that prepare our bodies for waking and sleeping hours. Experiments show that when a person is kept entirely in the dark, their circadian rhythm hardly alters, keeping more or less to a 24-hour day. But seeing too much or too little light, or receiving light at the wrong times of day, can leave the master clock confused as to the time of day. This upsets the rhythm of our cells and impacts on our health and well-being. It's a real problem for people who work at night, those with sleep disorders and also those with certain visual impairments that prevent light reaching those light-detecting ganglion cells. Studies have shown that disruptions to our natural rhythms put an extraordinary strain on the body, increasing the risk of a number of serious diseases, including cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes and depression. It can also impair your ability to think, which is why, here at Oxford, we're researching whether delaying the start of the school day by an hour or two to better suit the body clock of the average teenager could improve their exam results. Anyone for a lie-in? You may not be able to hear it ticking, but you can certainly feel your body clock at work. To learn more about the science of sleep and circadian rhythms, visit www.oxfordsparks.ox.ac.uk. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing that now.
and go back to our other screen that we just had on. Okay, so I think the video um, was really nice there because it kind of explained a little bit more about how our own natural body clocks actually work. So these are often known as circadian rhythms. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of notice as well that we have those receptors behind our eyes that pick up, you know, those general amounts of light that we have every single day. So different variations of light that we have throughout the day that we notice. And like you said, our body clock becomes accustomed to that amount of light. So we tend to have our own, our own routines and things that we do each day. Um, and we tend to find that we do a, you know, a lot of things in the same kind of pattern and your body gets used to that. And so like you said, it's picking up those receptors um, of light. And so then your own natural body clock becomes accustomed to that. And then that helps with sort of early evenings in the amounts of melatonin that is then released ready for your body to wind down and get ready for sleep. Um, so it was really interesting, actually, when it said that if you have any kind of disruption or anything new, um, you know, within your day to day pattern that can have a really knock on effect to your sleep. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, you can be in the dark for 24 hours, but that doesn't actually have any impact on your own natural body clock. But just that shift in the amount of variation of light. So just maybe certain new things that you might be doing throughout the day. Um, can actually have a big impact and sometimes we're not always in control of those changes that happen to us within the day as well um, so sometimes you know that that can be really hard then and have a knock-on effect on our own natural body clocks as well so what other things then might actually get in the way of sleep so like we were just talking, you know, we all have very, very busy lives. I think the world that we live in today in society, the Western world, it's a very fast paced world that we live in. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can recognize that we might have to take a step back and just ease down on things. Or, you know, it might be that things you know, creep up on us without necessarily noticing. Um, but, you know, just taking on board, you know, how hectic life might be. So also um, screen time and gadgets, um, so any, any kind of electronic devices. Um, a lot of children's learning nowadays within schools do take place, you know, on screens, on electronic devices. These do tend to be limited more at school, um, but we do recognise it is harder to try and limit these with children, um, you know, as and when they are at home, especially with children that are older, because you want to give them that independence, you know, to recognise when it's time to switch things off. Um, but there is actually a blue light that is emitted from electronic devices and screens, um, which then stimulates the part of the brain and reduces the amount of melatonin being produced and given off. Um, so they do recommend switching screen times off generally around an hour before winding, you know, before bedtime, um, you know, to give the body that chance to wind down and to be able to release those appropriate levels of melatonin. So it might be that, you know, the environment with, that you're in is quite noisy. It might be that you are quite sensitive with your auditory um, sense, your hearing. So, you know, just taking into account how noisy the environment is around you. Do you need to shut the window? Do you have children that share in a bedroom, you know, that are keeping others awake? Um, you know, just does the television need turning down? Just things like that, you know, that might get in the way, you know, things that are in our control that we can that we can uh, do to make that noise level reduce. So a lot of children sometimes will have stresses, some anxieties, maybe some worries that they want to talk about. Um, parents quite often notice that our children tend to like to talk about these as 
at that time just before they're getting ready to go to bed sometimes they've held it in all day um you know and they just want that release before they go to sleep um sometimes it might be that you just have that one-to-one -one quiet time you know in that wind down to bedtime that they feel safe and it's that opportunity for them to talk to you about anything that might be playing on their mind um, if your child, you know, doesn't have that, it might be something that you might like to introduce. Um, it might be that they prefer a creative way to maybe, you know, um, put down their worries or anxieties. So maybe drawing or colouring or writing in a diary and things like that. Also a nice way. So attachment can sometimes get in the way of sleep as well, especially as children get older, if they've been used to um, co-sleeping and then all of a sudden they get to a certain age where we expect them to be more grown up and all of a sudden we're expecting them to be sleeping on their own more. Um, you know, this can sometimes be um, hard for children, sometimes for parents as well, you know, just having that separation can be, can be hard on both sides. Um, so again, this is another thing to consider, um, you know, is there a reason, do they have any particular stresses or anxieties and that reason why they need to feel close to you? Um, you know, is it that appropriate time for them to be sleeping by themselves? And again, this comes into children's ages and stages of development. So, you know, not necessarily where they are physically in their milestones, but also socially and emotionally. You know, although they might be 10 and 11, 12, 13, you know, they might have a social emotional age of a child that's much younger. So maybe seven or eight or eight to nine, but they're still, you know, to a degree, not ready to quite be on their own at night. And just um, developmental stages in general. Um, so, you know, sometimes if there are developmental stages like puberty that they are going through, um, again, you know, this can affect sleep as well. So we're just going to have a little bit more of a look around the teenage brain. So what happens to the teenage brain and puberty? Um, so adults use the front part of their brain, which is also known as the frontal cortex, to think, assess and to plan. So by using brain scans, researchers actually found that the front part of a teenager's brain is actually underdeveloped. So that frontal cortex isn't quite developed as we would see in an adult. Um, so teenagers tend to use an emotional part of the brain, which is called the amygdalalia, um, so more than adults. So this is why, you know, it's really hard for sometimes for teenagers to think logically. Sometimes we see them being quite impulsive, not always considering risks like an adult actually would. Um, so this is where that frontal cortex would normally come in with an adult's brain. They're able to assess that risk around them. They're able to think more logically. Um, whereas with a teenager, they are more emotional. So they'll go more with their feelings and how they're feeling. So, you know, if they're teenagers, teenage friends are feeling that it's an OK situation, you know, it might be that your teenager is picking up on that and thinking the same. So puberty is a time when the teenager's physical growth speeds up and this is controlled by the release of growth hormones. So girls are around 11 years and boys are around 14 years. So as we see there, girls do tend to mature faster actually than boys um, so the brain actually matures in girls around the age of 19 so by this point the brain is fully developed um, and fully matured whereas for boys it's not until they're around 25 um, so again this might be where you see those differences in behaviors you know that we see girls being more responsible being acting more grown up as such um, you know whereas boys, having that bit more immature behaviours that we sometimes see. So the impact of puberty then. Um, so in teenagers, the sleep hormone known as melatonin is released about 1 a.m. compared to those in adults, which is actually around 10 p.m. So you might notice as your teenager, 
um, you know, is going into that puberty stage that they are wanting to stay up later. It might be that they're gaming until late into the night. Um, and some children, you know, they're able to do this. They're able to get up the next morning and function as normal, um, you know, but for some, you know, dependent on how their natural rhythms are, their circadian rhythms and body clock, you know, some may deal better than others um, when doing this. So teenagers will continue with this sleep pattern until they have pretty much finished puberty. And um, so near the end of puberty, they will change to an adult pattern. So those times where they've been staying up later will start to become earlier and earlier. Um, so for girls, again, we were saying that's around 19, 19 and a half. And for boys, generally around 21, possibly a bit later. Um, so it's quite interesting when you kind of see the impact, um, you know, that puberty has on their sleep. And I think in the video it, it mentioned, you know, there was research around school, you know, starting slightly later um, for those children that aren't able to necessarily, you know, wake up the next morning and function as they should. So the... The visual that we have here actually just shows the average amount of sleep um, over a variety of ages. So, um, you know, when children are younger, they are needing a big chunk of sleep. So around, you know, anywhere from 11 to 16, 17, 18 hours of sleep. As they get older, that tends to reduce, but still needing a good chunk, you know, between eight to 10 hours of sleep, possibly 11. Um, and as you can see, as they get older into teenage years, this does decrease. Um, but again, it's important to remember that, you know, this is just a recommendation and that everybody is different and unique. And you might find with your siblings as well. So if you've got multiple children that their sleep patterns may differ as well. So this is really important to take into account, you know, if you do have children that are actually sharing a room together, um, you know. So what might be then the signs of possible sleep deprivation? So we might see children that are struggling um, with their emotions, so struggling to convey how they're feeling, struggling to understand how they're feeling or identifying those emotions and then being able, you know, to struggle calming down and being able to understand those. So they might have difficulty functioning the next day. So just like we were just talking about, you know, that they're not able to get themselves up, get themselves off to school like they normally would. We might see them having difficulty listening and processing information and instructions. Um, I think as parents, you know, we quite often, um, you know, accusing our children of having that selective listening. Um, but actually, when we look at the brain development um, and we look at their sleep patterns, you know, it's it's not surprising if they're having limited sleep that, you know, this might be something that we see more of. They might have a change in appetite. So it might be, you know, that they don't have much of an appetite. They they're too tired to actually get something to eat. Um, it might be that rather than having their three meals a day, that they're just picking on, on what's to hand, um, something that's quick, something that they don't have to bother cooking. And um, so you might just see those changes in appetite, or it might be that they're eating more and more than they normally would. They might have a lack of focus and a lack of control. Um, so again, you might see those um, impulsive behaviours. Um, you know, doing things that they wouldn't necessarily do. It might be that they're struggling to communicate. So this, again, can be a wide spectrum. If they're feeling really tired and lethargic, they might be mumbling. They might be finding it hard to verbalise and use their, their muscles in their mouths to, to actually verbalise the words that they want to say. Or it might be that they're quite manic and frantic and that they're speaking really fast. And again, we're not able to quite understand what they're saying. We might notice excessive napping, so sleeping later into the day than they usually would. Um, you know, sleeping in is quite common for teenagers, but it might be that they get up for short periods and then go back to bed. 
And then those energy levels that we were just talking about. So as much as noticing it in the communication, you might notice it in their body language and in their um, general Physi physiological behaviors um so you might notice they're very lethargic they're just you know really struggling to even get up and walk to a short distance um you might find they're the opposite end of the spectrum where they're literally buzzing they're very frantic they're very manic can't sit still for five minutes so sleep diaries are really really good um at being able to keep um a record really of you know things that you might find difficult, any anxieties maybe around school. As children get older, these are things um, that they can complete themselves. They can come up with their own sleep diaries if they want to. There are downloadable ones that families can download as well. Um, but just to kind of pinpoint those areas um, that might be a struggle. Um, so if you do go and look for further support, again, um, you know, professionals can give you these as well to complete. So there are different sleepy foods that might aid sleep. Um, almonds are a really, really good one. So almonds actually contain magnesium, so promoting both sleep and muscle relaxation. So they can also help to keep blood sugars stable throughout the night as well. So less chances then of waking up in the night. Bananas are really good as well. So they contain really high levels of potassium and magnesium, and as well as an amino acid called tryptophan. And this also is an amino acid that helps to aid sleep. So you can try maybe blending a banana in a cup of milk, make it into a milkshake for an ideal bedtime drink, or you could just choose to eat a banana before you go to bed as well. So dairy, dairy is another one that's really, really good. So any kind of yogurt, any kind of milk or cheese, again, containing that tryptophan, that amino acid. Um, so also calcium is also known to be a good stress relief. Um, and although we hear superstition around eating cheese at bedtime, giving you nightmares, um, you know, it is just superstition. It's not actually true. If anything, dairy is really, really good to eat before bedtime. So we've also got porridge oats or oatmeal, which is rich in calcium, magnesium and phosphorus and potassium and then also silicone. Um, so the silicone is a natural expanding um, substance which expands in the stomach and keeps you full for longer so that can then prevent you from waking in the night with hunger and hopefully help to aid better sleep so we've also got cherries as well especially tart cherries very sour cherries um, these can help to boost melatonin so that chemical that hormone that's released um, ready to aid the body for sleep so again, you can try maybe drinking this, blending it into a smoothie. You can try having them frozen or dried as well. And then we've got cereal, which is a complex carbohydrate. And um, so again, this contains that tryptophan and releases that into the bloodstream. Um, try to avoid sugary cereals though, um, because this will give children a sugar rush. Um, and we don't want to be giving them a sugar rush before they go to bed. Um, so thinking about then bedtime routines. Um, so research actually shows that children who follow bedtime routines are actually more likely to go to sleep earlier, take less time falling asleep, sleep for longer and wake up less during the night. So these benefits to sleep quality were actually seen in children years later who had followed bedtime routines when they were younger. It's important to remember, though, that even if your child has never had a bedtime routine, if even if they are slightly older and are teenagers, it's still OK to have a go at introducing a bedtime routine. Because as much as it wasn't maybe the appropriate time when they were younger, it might be that now is the appropriate time. Um, so this just gives you um, a visual or an idea of how a routine might, might be for your child to plan. So it's nice when children are older to actually give them that 
um, you know, to give them that independence to make their own routine. So this is quite a nice one that children can fill out themselves, um, have a bit of a think about it themselves, what they want their bedtime routine to look like and thinking about how long they want their bedtime routine to last as well. But again, you know, if they are creative, they can devise their own routines. Again, there are ones that you can download off the internet as well. Um, and this, the link at the bottom has some really good information um, around bedtime routines as well. So some nice extra tips then just thinking about, um, you know, aiding sleep to try and incorporate regular exercise into the day can just help to release any extra energy levels that your child might have and just help them to release that energy ready for winding down in the evenings. So it might be that they want to go for a walk as a family, it might be that you know you want to just take the dog for a walk, it might be that they want to meet up in the gym with their friends, um, go play football or basketball. So choosing that activity that your child finds fun. If they want something a little more gentle um, at the bottom, it might be that they want to do some yoga or Pilates. We've mentioned already about the um, blue light that's emitted from electronic devices. So just remembering to try and switch those off um, at least an hour before bed. It might be that you want to do this as a whole family approach. So Teenagers will tend to be more on board um, if they're not being singled out to have to do something by themselves. If they can be, if they can physically see that everyone else in the family is doing it as well, and it's not just them, they're more likely to actually resist less and be more on board. Um, so you know, if you can give them that encouragement and role model what you want them to do, that's really really good. So try to avoid caffeine before bedtime um, because this is actually a stimulant for the brain and also for the bladder um, so drinking it before bedtime you know they're going to be overthinking things and possibly waking to go to the toilet in the night as well and just at the bottom we do have the energy drinks which are very popular with teenagers um, again, these have very high levels of caffeine as well. So just to bear in mind that even if they're not drinking coffee itself, that they are still getting caffeine from these drinks. Um, so try not to let your teen lie in bed um, for hours of a weekend and holidays. Again, thinking back to their normal patterns within term time. Um, if this is disrupted, again, it's going to have an impact on their body clock, um, you know, and have a knock on effect of how they function then the next day. So try and keep as much as you possibly can to that normal pattern and that normal cycle. Um, so try not to let your teenager overeat as well towards bedtime. So again, talking about that ex, um, snacking that might be taking place, that change to their normal diet um, and their pattern of eating. So again, it can cause discomfort, um, you know, and it's not necessarily going to be digested very well before they go to bed, which can then they can become discomfort and restlessness. So it might be that you want to try replacing screen time with some activities that can help to wind down in the evening. So it might be that you want to do something practical like crocheting or knitting. These are becoming much more popular with your younger children now. It might be that they just want to relax and listen to some music. Maybe reading a book before bedtime. That could be something that you might want to do together as a family or they might want to do individually by themselves. Again, doing some colouring or some drawing. Again, you know, releasing any anxieties or stress or worries that they might have from the day. So construction as well is a good um, activity to wind down. Again, it might be that you want to work together on something to construct or maybe just playing a simple board game. Um, you know, so if you've got any board games in the cupboard that you haven't played for a while, um, again, this might be a nice quiet activity to do. I think a lot of parents, you know, with lives being so busy, it's 
hard to try and keep consistent if you are establishing maybe a new bedtime routine or just trying to tweak or make any changes to your day to day lives. Um, but it is it is important to try and keep to these new routines if you can every day. Um, so a nighttime routine for children should consist of the same steps every night or as many nights as possible to get the benefits and try for both parents to participate in the routine where possible or the whole family. So like we were saying with that whole family approach um, for everybody to be on board. Try and keep it short and sweet. Um, you know, don't want to prolong it any longer than you need to. Again, giving this um, independence to older children to think about how they want their routine to look. Um, you know, they can decide then how long they want their routine to be. Um, you know, it might be that their routine is slightly longer if they've got to have a bath or a shower as well. So try to keep to a routine in the day. Um, as much as in the evening as well, getting into that good habit of having a routine. So like we've mentioned, trying to keep to exercising, keeping, you know, those levels of sunlight and vitamin D and having some outdoor space in the fresh air can also help to have a better night's sleep. So it's important to listen to your children as well, you know, taking that time to maybe have a family talk. You know, as, um, as much as you are as parents there to give that guidance and keep those boundaries to a degree, you know, listen to your child's concerns. Are there any ways that it could be tweaked um, to make it better for them? Can you give them any areas of independence a bit more themselves if that's something that they're needing? Um, and keeping to sleep hygiene rules. So again, thinking about that environment, is their bedroom dark and cool and quiet to promote sleep? Um, you know, do they need any kind of a nightlight if they're still not sure about being in the dark? Again, helping them to feel safe and secure, ready for sleep. Um, you know, is there noise levels that need reducing in the house? Um, you know, do they need you to go in and say goodnight to them as well? So if you are thinking of making any changes, trying to make them gradual and not too much at once. So like we're saying, trying not to disrupt those natural rhythms as much as we can. So just trying to make those small changes very gradually. Um, so it might be if they are, you know, in term time, we tend to stick to a certain pattern, but in the holidays, it might be that they're staying up later, but they need to come back down to their normal bedtime ready to go back to school in September. So it might be just that you shift that bedtime to slightly earlier, just by about 10, 15 minutes per day, just very gradually at a very gradual pace. OK, so we've now got some sources of support. So things that you might find useful um, and there's some really good information on our Starting Well Partnership website. So you can find us at startingwellworcestershire.nhs.uk. Um, we've also got Young Minds that have got some really good um, good information, some good sources of support, as well as the Sleep Foundation um, sleep for Kids, as well as the NHS website as well. So if you do feel following from today's webinar that you do have any further questions or queries, um, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us um, on the Starting Well website where you can make a referral for parenting support. Um, or additionally, um, you know, you can get in contact with one of our hubs. All of our contact details are on our Starting Well website. Um, so, you know, if we do provide you with some parenting support, we do look forward to seeing you in our family hubs very soon. OK, everybody. So thank you for joining us for our Better Sleeping Habits webinar today. Thank you. Bye bye.